All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our community connection on September 20th, 2022. For those that may not know me, I'm Carol Spicer, owner of Spicer Facilitation and Learning, and I'm very pleased to have you join us this morning for our community connection. I'm so excited to be back. This is the first time I've offered community connection since pre-pandemic days. Um, I, I certainly was in the virtual space all through a pandemic and doing a lot of different things. However, uh, this one's geared primarily for not-for-profits and not-for-profits were scrambling uh, during the last couple of years, trying to figure out how to deliver programming and so on. So I sort of put this one on hiatus uh, for a little bit. But out of a request um, from someone in a not-for-profit, I reached out to our guest speakers today and I'm very um, pleased to have you join us. So before I kick things off, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the community of Pasadena on the west coast of Newfoundland Labrador, which is in the unceded territory of the ancient Beothic. And I ask that you join me with and acknowledge with respect the diversity and the traditions and cultures of all of the Indigenous people in our province. So not only the Beothic, but the Mi'kmaq, the Innu, the Inuit, and the Southern Labrador Inuit. Um, and I ask you to think about that from where you're joining us today. And on that, perhaps you can start to make your way to chat, um, which is a little thought bubble up top, and uh, type in chat for me uh, who you are and where you're joining us from. Um, all right, thank you, Yari. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, popping in today. So the Community Connection, for those that haven't joined before, uh, as I mentioned, it is targeted towards the not-for-profit community. Um, in the number of years for my uh, business, probably about 80% of my clients are actually in the not-for-profit community. And there's a lot of similarities between each of you. Um, some of you are actually um, targeting the same audience within our province, trying to help them. Um, you, a lot of you tend to have the same challenges, the same successes, and so Based on a conversation that I had with somebody in Cornerbrook, um, probably about four and a half, five years ago now, um, she had mentioned that there used to be an opportunity for not-for-profits to come together and chat. And so I decided to offer this opportunity on uh, a virtual platform and expand it a little bit beyond. And I know we have folks here today from St. John's as well as other uh, parts of our community, uh, our province. So I offer this as my way of giving back to you folks who are giving so much of yourselves uh, to our province to make it a better place. So very happy to have you join us here today and um, hope to kind of ramp this session going up again um, in the, uh, make it a little bit more regular as we go along. Um, so as I see the, the welcomes coming in, that's great. Um, I gave Quinn a, a, you'll see on hers, um, I couldn't remember, I'd met Quinn before, whether her pronoun was your majesty. I called her Duchess this morning, so <laughs> um, Queen always keeps me on my toes. Uh, I was very happy to do that. Um, so thank you so much again for joining. So today we've got Debbie Brown and Michelle Abdullah and Roshane Mendes are all with Association for New Canadians, uh, located in Cornerbrook. And I'll ask them to do a little bit more of an introduction on their role. And the reason I reached out to them to be our guests today was that a question was raised to me around the population is changing. Quinn and I were just having a conversation actually before folks were joining. Newfoundland Labrador used to be, let's face it, very white homogenous population. It is no longer that. Um, diversity and inclusion and recognition of all kinds of challenges and successes that people are facing, um, you know, is something that we're, being, we're coming up against. And so, we're looking for a bit of guidance from folks that are a little bit closer to it than us, perhaps, on how do we connect with newcomers in our community? How do we make them feel welcome? Uh, I've been a mentor with the Atlantic Study and Stay program with Hillary, and we just did a session in, in um, some consultations back in June, and the newcomers are wondering, how do we find out what's happening in the community? <laughs> How do we get to bring our kids to something in the community? So, I, you know, I think there's really both sides of this. As not-for-profits, often you're looking for volunteers. As newcomers in a community, they're awful, often looking for uh, events or places to go. So really, that's kind of my little lead-in. I'm going to, um, you know, ask Debbie and, and Roshane and Michelle to kind of take us through a conversation, and, and then we'll go from there, if that's okay with you folks. 
Perfect. Thank you, Carol. I'm Debbie Brown. I'm the coordinator of diversity and public education for the ANC. So my team is based all across the province. We have offices in St. John's and we've, I've got uh, some of our team is there. We've got Roshane here on this side. We've got uh, more people up in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So we're, we're all over. And I'll let Ms. Shaw and uh, Roshane introduce themselves. So I'm Roshane Mendes. Um, I'm the diversity uh, officer here in Cornerbrook and I work uh, closely with Debbie. Um, and I've joined the team six weeks now and quite new to the role. <laughs> so yeah, it's nice seeing you all. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Abdullah. I'm the Community Connections Officer for the Association for New Canadians in Cornerbrook Satellite Office. Uh, hi, Quinn. I have worked with uh, Quinn for a lot of uh, events, activities we organize here in Cornerbrook, and uh, we meet again, Carol. Thank you yes. so much for uh, inviting us for the uh, presentation. There you go. Now we're going. All right. Excellent. Now I have to bring the other one back up so that I lose you again. It's the two screen thing that uh, yeah. makes it a little easier for us in presenting. But there we go. So, uh, so there there you are, yes. um, now you're seeing it? Perfect. Yes. So we just want to acknowledge that we as well uh, are on the land of the Beotok Mi'kmaq Inu and Inuit. So I'm going to, we're going to go quickly through this first section. Uh, if you don't know about the Association for New Canadians, we are a nonprofit. We have actually, I meant to change that slide. We have over 160 staff now, and we have offices all across the province in Cornerbrook, Gander, Grand Falls, Labrador City, Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Porto, Clarenville. So wherever you are, we are able to help you. Some of the programs that we cover our resettlement and settlement, helping people integrate within their new home, language training and assessment, careers and employment, that's a big one that helps people with their resume, with job finding, with interview skills. Diversity in public education is my team uh, and we are the public facing side. We work most often with businesses, organizations, educational institutions, helping with diversity and equity and inclusion and anti-racism training. The Child and Youth Program helps people, helps children move into the school system. Volunteer and Community Connections is our, our community side helping with the newcomers in connecting with the community, but as well as having people that are living here in Newfoundland become volunteers. So I'm going to go into culture and we're going to give our presentation, we'll give a little overview of some of the things to think about when working with people from different cultures and then some of the practices for hiring or finding volunteers or working with newcomers. So I will hand it over to Roshane. Thanks, Debbie. Yes, so this is like the cycle that a newcomer goes through uh, when they come to Canada first. So for an example, when you try to talk about the honeymoon period, it's like being a tourist in another country where you get to see the nice places, get to taste new food, get to talk to people. So it's like that small window, like maybe two or three weeks that you start enjoying the place. So we call it the honeymoon period. And when people stay much longer in the community, there comes the culture shock. Uh, for an example, I talk about myself when I first came here. I came in 2018 and I loved the place. I went sightseeing, I had friends, I tasted new food, and it was like, I was really comfortable. But then after a few months, you get to know the culture and um, get to get in depth into the, uh, uh, the community and the environment and start talking to people. And then there is this shock that you go through the, this phase where you don't know what to do because you are away from family, you are away from friends, uh, you are alone here. And then you have that mental isolation that you go through where you don't know who to 
talk to if you have something in need or is there somebody who can help me out with this uh, difficult situation so how do the newcomers reach out and to whom they can reach out in these kinds of situations is problematic sometimes so uh, this is where like a lot of organizations or if it's a school like teachers can play a huge role here in helping helping them to get adapted to the situation so once they get that help, they make friends, they learn the culture, uh, then they go into adjustment and adaptation. But once they adapt, we don't say that it's over from there. For an example, if they move out to another community or to a new job, then they flip over back and forth as well. So because uh, different places and different organizations have different cultures. so. It's like constantly going through this life cycle that we need to understand where the individual is exactly and what kind of help we can give them. Um, and also like immigrants and newcomers, they play like a dual role. I won't say like play like a dual role. They have this like two cultures. They have their own culture with them and then they understand and try to understand another culture where it is uh, going back and forth between these two cultures as well, which is which can be difficult to uh, understand sometimes. Um, so the next slide. Maybe. So when we talk about culture, we all know the language, the dress code, the food. That's what we see out there when we talk about culture. But culture, but these all, all these aspects are just the face value but culture is much more than that. It is the invisible element uh, that we often don't see, the beliefs, the life experiences, the assumptions or the viewpoints of each individual, all this comes as culture. So uh, culture is shared by a group of people, maybe from the same country, but it is learned along the way. It does not pass through generations. For an example, my great grandmother will have like a different aspect or different viewpoint and beliefs about culture uh, as opposed to me. So I learn things on the way and then that will change uh, my uh, beliefs and attitudes and assumptions. So, and also culture is this largely invisible part that often we don't see and it can be, it is, changing um, uh, throughout the years and with experiences. Um, for an example, um, I also give this example, like Sri Lanka has been, when you take Sri Lanka, we think about, okay, it's one cultural aspect, but no, there are different cultures in Sri Lanka. When you talk about India, it's the same. So it's like, even though they are from the same country, there can be different cultures. So people, have different uh, beliefs and attitudes. So all this shapes what culture is. Thank you, Roshane. I'm going to move on now to look at just two of the cultural values that are big, um, I won't say obstacles, because they're not obstacles, but if we don't understand cultural values, it can cause conflict within our organizations, within the workplace, when we're dealing with the public. So I'm going to look at just two big ones, um, not that they are the most important or anything in that way, but, but there's probably about 10 and we only have a short period of time today. So first I wanna look at individualism versus collectivism, because this one is really, uh, important when you're hiring or when you are finding volunteers. We think of individualism as I'm responsible for me and I'm independent. So self-sufficient, unique, uh, autonomy. And these are things that we often associate with, with North American culture. And when I say um, these North American or Asian, these are generalizations because workplaces have different cultures and people themselves have different value systems. So in general, the culture of North America that we put out in social media is more an individualism based society. So we really value being unique. Collectivism, and when we think 
oftentimes of Asian cultures where we're looking at the, the how we work together and what we do, how it benefits society as a group. And why that's really important is, so we think of North America as being more individualism, having more individualism, but for me, I'm more, I, when I look at the spectrum, I'm over closer to collectivism. So how that shows up is if you're interviewing someone, for example, I'll often get asked like, why are you the best person for the job? And I'll start talking about what my team did and what we were able to accomplish and how I was able to support this team. And then we accomplished these things together. And then employers will say, or maybe you're looking for a volunteer. And the same deal is, is we're saying, well, we did this, we, we. And so you'll think, well, that person can't do anything. They're no good. Um, but that's a value judgment. And it's, it's because collectivism, it's not about taking the credit. It's uh, about, or or having that independence, or it's how you worked as a team. And so we have to shift sometimes our, our own cultural values and allow that space to say, okay, well, I'm asking the question about why are you the best? And they're answering it this way. It might be that they come from a different cultural background, not that they aren't able to accomplish anything on their own. So it's a matter of of looking at our own cultural values, of being able to recognize what we value, and then also recognize that someone else may value something different from us as, as we're hiring, us as an organization or a, a staff. The next one that's really important is communication. So low context versus high context. And communication can cause all sorts of issues. So low context, we think of direct verbal communication. So there's not a lot of, of other information that we have to consider. We're thinking about the words. And we, again, think of North America as being more low context, direct communication. I've read some research and, and some research says this is because North America has so many different cultures that the easiest way to communicate is to be absolutely direct. High context, we think about Asian cultures, some uh, countries in Africa, where it's all about the hand, the body language. Also, there is a level of assumed knowledge there's a level of, of assumed norms that become part of that communication. And so we say North America is more low context, but when we think of Newfoundland, Newfoundland is actually quite high context. And that can be really uh, difficult for newcomers. We, uh, we have expressions, different uh, knowledge that we use or we reference that we think everybody knows within the culture. Um, we also think of it not just between Newfoundland, um, it can be just different diversity within different communities. My husband is on the autism spectrum, he has Asperger's, and so for him, communication is very direct. I'm very high context, there's lots of hand motion, and so we understand that about each other, and we'll often have things where I'll be saying, wouldn't it be nice if we had hot chocolate now? Wouldn't that be nice? And he completely doesn't see that side. I would have to say, I would like to have hot chocolate now. And so we'll laugh and we'll say, oh, that was very high context. So sometimes it's just understanding and not getting angry about a miscommunication and just understanding that people come from different uh, they're comfortable with different ways of communicating. Then moving into recruitment and retention. Thank you, Debbie. Um, yeah, so this graph uh, gives you like a summarized uh, form of how many resumes it takes uh, a person to get an interview. So this research was done in 2016 and following up with this research, 
the Harvard Business Review published another article about whitening resumes, where they um, removed the ethnicity of uh, individuals and apply to the same jobs. And the results were, they have mentioned 25% of black candidates received callbacks from their whitened resumes, while only 10% got calls when they left ethnic details. And among Asians, 21% got callbacks when they whitened their resumes, whereas only 11% heard back when they had their racial references in their resumes. So it is still this part of uh, recruitment and retention needs a lot of work. Um, so the next slide, Debbie. Uh, so this leads us to unconscious bias. And when I say unconscious bias, bias is not something that's bad. It's something that we all have because we are humans. So for an example, if I walk into a room and I see a lot of people, I tend to go and talk to a person, like an Asian person first, to feel comfortable. So that's not a bad thing. It's just that we need to be aware when we do our recruitment and uh, retention process or in our organizations we need to be aware that it doesn't influence our decision making so um, for an example there are various types of bias uh, affinity bias is um, one such bias is affinity bias where people feel that they are connected uh, with others who have the same interests uh, for an example, I find somebody who has played the same sport in school and I might tend to uh, have bias towards that person because we have the same interests. So those types of bias, uh, um, bias should be like we need to be aware when we uh, use them in our organizations. Yeah, Debbie, over to you. Perfect. So as Roshan said, we all have bias. It's, it's not taking this level of you're a bad person because it's not about being good or bad. We grow up with these biases. I like dogs. I talk to people that have dogs. That bias is benign. It doesn't cause any impact. However, when we're doing the hiring or accepting um, volunteers into the organization, we want to be able to minimize how much our own bias, and that can be the confirmation bias. There's all different kinds, and I won't, we won't go into every single one, but there's, we have a tendency to have many different types of, of, of bias that will, will look for something that agrees with what we already believe. So if we hire a committee or we have a group of people, that will minimize the impact because that bias will be different from each person and we'll all come with different things that we're, we're looking for when we're hiring someone or when we're trying to involve community members. So we'll get a, a more broad perspective. If we establish objective criteria beforehand so that we have something that we're basing it on, then we're not going to go into that interview or when we're um, looking for volunteers of only trying to find people who are already the same as, as, as us or as the, the person that's hiring. If we offer training, which is what we do here at, uh, in the diversity department, Roshane and I, training to help people look internally as as a company but also as individuals that aspect of why am i making this decision why have i had this reaction to someone right away where is that coming from within me or within how we've been set up in this office is it truly uh something that we value or is this something that we need to check and and look at our internal bias. So review policies, procedures, looking at that exactly, that what do we have in place that could continue the systemic racism that we already see? And then posting our jobs or our media, our volunteer calls on a 
social media and a broader range because not all newcomers are going to be accessing the same places. So being aware of that. And then tips for when we're dealing with, so it says interview process, but this can be when we have new clients coming into our, um, our organizations. Newcomers may have very little experience, not only interviewing for jobs, but working within organizations or understanding what nonprofits have to offer. That might be very different in a different country. So understanding that, that base of experience could be quite different. So to go back to the beginning and explain something at, uh, if, if necessary, to explain the, the process so that people aren't getting lost. So if we set things up before someone is coming in, if you have a volunteer coming in or a client coming in to access your services, to upfront let them know what will happen in a meeting and what questions will come up so that they're prepared and have, because if they are, if they, if English is their second or third or fourth language, they need to prepare. They might need to be able to understand things before coming in. So be aware of that. Um, send advance notice if you have clients or volunteers or if you're hiring. And then back to Roshane. Uh, I've lost Roshane. Can you hear Roshane? You're on mute still, Roshane. Okay. So sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. So yeah, so uh, some of the practices that we need to be aware are like gender roles, for an example, uh, where if we have, um, let's say, a female from the Muslim community and we have like a focus group discussion with all males in the room, that won't work well. So if we are aware of their culture and what needs to be done, so we can adjust our workspace to uh, accommodate uh, those cultural practices. And the next is show respect uh, for one's language, customs, and try to understand them. For an example, when someone, uh, English is not the first language for many, uh, immigrants and new Canadians come in. So uh, understanding that some of the terminologies can change and uh, they are constantly learning. So it's encouraging them and being aware of that and showing respect. Um, and the third is do not make assumptions uh, about a person's experience. For an example, um, like I came because I wanted to come to Canada, but then there are so many out there who has been forced to come to another country and leave all their belongings, their family out there. So it is like a huge shock for them to absorb. So not assuming on top of that of a person's identity or uh, their past, uh, it would help them to have like a safe space uh, within their organization and environment. Um, and becoming self-aware of our own values and their cultures. It's like have an open discussion, talk to them. And uh, for an example, I, I use this as well. My name is Roshane and it's not difficult to pronounce, I hope. <laughs> uh, not really difficult, but then there are uh, that I've got, uh, I had a friend of mine who said, okay, it's difficult for me to pronounce, but I'll just call you Rosh. And at that point, I just started thinking, why did she say that? Can can somebody at least pay some respect and try to repeat their name with me? And to at least be aware that I would like somebody to at least take that stance or um, be more aware about what I would like. So it's like these little things that we sometimes often do, but it, it I won't say like it's bad, It's 
it is hard sometimes our names are quite hard for people to pronounce it's just that taking that effort and uh, that time and showing respect uh, for a person's identity and culture and always ask questions there is no right or wrong in culture or uh, discrimination and things we learn constantly i learn every day and uh, it's same for everybody so it's always good to ask and uh, see what they feel about it and uh, how they would like to be called or uh, what adjustments we would like to make uh, in our organizations and also make clients your staff stakeholders aware of the policies about discrimination if we have policies in place just make them aware uh, about what is uh, there and uh, finally, like Debbie mentioned, it is a constant learning process. So we need to be aware about culture. So nobody can learn everything about every culture. It is it is a, a not easy task and it cannot be done. So there is no finished line to be competent and an expert in culture. So this is where education and uh, reaching out to uh, communities matter a lot and um by reaching out to communities and knowing about their culture and being involved makes a culturally safe space to new canadians and immigrants and this is where michelle comes in to talk about community connections and how we can get involved with the community michelle sorry i uh, i didn't advance your slide there roshane my fault um I will go so everyone sorry about that there was and there was also speak slower not louder which in Newfoundland we sometimes do if we think people are uh, if English is their second language yelling is not actually going to help we have to look at trying different ways or different words to use and then this was the slide sorry and now I will get to Michelle hi so uh, this is my part now community connections so my, before I start, like there was something uh, Carol had mentioned, like so, how to get into the activities, events, volunteering that the newcomers are involved in. So like this is one source I have like sent it in the chat. So it is uh, the URL link is the uh, Facebook page of ANC Cornerbrook. So we have a Facebook page for. Uh, our headquarters so, uh, on Facebook, that is the Association for New Canadians. And for each satellite office, we have separate um, uh, page like set up on Facebook. So this is the URL link for the Cornerbrook satellite office. So what we are trying to do is um, changing our um, Facebook page to a newspaper. So that is beneficial for the newcomers like in our region. So we covered like the, the Western Newfoundland. So all the way until port of -Basque. And um, so all the events, activities that we provide to our clients, newcomers are for free. So there will be only like a registration. They have to sign up. There will be posters. We uh, um, uh, like posted on the Facebook like in advance like of the event. And uh, it is not just an event what we are trying to organize over here. We part, um, that is basically my job like is to create, um, build partnership like in the region. So I had uh, work with Quinn for several events. Uh, she's from the CMHI and uh, we had uh, organized a lot of events like last uh, this year uh, for, uh, during the multiculturalism month like in March and uh, various other organizations throughout this year. And it was great turnout and it um, creates an opportunity for the newcomers to build friendship like in the local residents and inclusivity and uh, for the ESL, English as second language, I'm in charge like for the volunteering. So the, um, it is my email address, I have uh, sent it in the chat. So if there is like anyone who are interested in volunteering with ANC, um, it can be for like any um, events or um, uh, activities we organize or also for the English as second language conversation cafe, which we usually do it at the public library here in Cornerbrook every bi-weekly. And uh, that's it. So now I get to the point of uh, my work like um can you uh, bring back to the Go previous back. one sorry yeah. yes no worries so 
my job is to engage local volunteers and newcomers in order to create meaningful community connections so that is with the volunteers and also newcomers so what i'm trying to do over here is uh, as um, uh, Devi and Roshin had like, mentioned about the the iceberg, like after the honeymoon period, so like people tend to the newcomers when uh, or like it just not like with the newcomers, anyone who move to a different area, like actually goes through that point so it can be like anyone like moving from a mainland like to Newfoundland or like vice versa actually go through that period so with the newcomer part like what i try to do is here uh, organize even cultural events and activities where they feel like homely like everything that have uh, they uh, they have like missed back in their home uh, to organize it over here like feel that home feeling here and at the same time to educate and also give an opportunity for the local residents to experience the the culture traditions of uh, the newcomers who is settling down like in the the region and for the the volunteer aspect so we have newcomer match program so it is in which where we uh, match a local residence um, uh, family um, as a matchup program with similar interest and hobbies or like with um, english tutoring and uh, what we do is like we link our newcomer family with a local residence it can be an individual or a family with similar interests we match make them where like, they are able to build a friendship like going forward and the other ones are academic tutor program esl cafe program and esl training center volunteers so i intake like for the uh, anc volunteer so there is a very really small formality of like filling out a client intake form and i issue like a letter for to waive the uh, police clearance and from as of from there like i'll be posting like the uh, interested volunteers of our upcoming events and uh, activities and uh, mainly as said before i organize uh, social cultural and recreational events so it will be um, we, uh, we have the items um, uh, sports equipments like purchase for um, snowshoe cricket and uh, for yoga and uh, um, uh, snowshoeing and skiing and such so this is not just like an, an international um, events that we are doing we wanted to do like winter activities like with the local residents and newcomers and go from there like and vice versa like cricket will be like something new for the region so during summer like when they are in the newcomers will be teaching like the local residents like how to play cricket and during winter like the other way around like the local residents will be uh, teaching the newcomers how to play hockey and uh, all the other like winter activities skiing i never did like so far so like i have to link to it like, and this is something like very different we uh, will be experiencing in uh, this beautiful country over here and the other one is we have like a community healthy living fund and it is a way where to introduce newcomers to social recreational activities in the western region so this is with um, the fund we have like used to um, uh, purchase uh, sports equipment and something like very new like for um, the newcomers to experience the the local traditions and also their like to introduce it to the local residents mm -hmm. And the next uh, slide, Debbie. Thank you so much. And this is a collage of uh, some of the events uh, we have. Um, I did it like in the, um, the last one year. I joined last year in October. Since then, it was a great event we organized so far, like with the partnership of um, uh, various organizations here in Cornerbrook. And the top left, uh, it is uh, Jackie Sherman. She, uh, she is from Bangladesh, performed for the uh, Jigs and Wheels event. It was an event organized by the city of Cornerbrook, part of the Kamkom year. And to the top middle, it is Nantimal and uh, Indiviri. She, they are from Sri Lanka, performed for an event we did here, Respect Your Elders, as part of the World Elders uh, Abuse Awareness Day. We went to one of the elder citizens' home, and then we performed uh, for the 85 senior citizens there. 
and I also organize um, events, cultural events, and also uh, religious uh, events. We had uh, Eid al Fitr. For the first time, we organized an Eid al Fitr uh, gathering here in Cornerbrook. And we have beautiful uh, newcomers like who are dressed up in their like newly uh, clothes and pose for a photo for us. And in the middle, we have ESL to the uh, middle left side. We have our friends from ESL students from Grumfell campus who volunteered like, for the Multiculturalism Month. It was in part, the, uh, the whole month in March, we partnered with uh, CMHI, uh, Grumfell campus, College of North Atlantic, Wine Place Community Center, and Rotary Arts Theater to uh, organize events like for the Multiculturalism Month. And every week we had like events organized. And we went to all the elementary, intermediate, and regional high school to give presentation about like the newcomers' um, traditions and like what are their clothing. Like we uh, educated like the um, the elementary students and the intermediate students about like what are it and it is like really important like right now where there's a lot of newcomers like settling down like in the region and it was a great event and we have like invitation to visit again like to do the same thing like next year and the middle one we have like a different event we did like the henna design it is i don't know if uh, you know like about the henna design it is a temporary uh, tattooing um so it went really well that is uh, zoedia like for the jigsaw and wheels uh we did a newcomer youth art creation event part of the um uh, come home here and uh they are elena and uh yaroslava they are from ukraine so we have a uh, handprints across the world that we have exhibited in our office here and at the bottom left, we have uh, Farzin. They, um, they were youth who had like drawn uh, pictures for the elder citizens. Like when we went for the event on uh, the World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. And the bottom middle one, they, we have like all the newcomers post for a photo as part of the Multiculturalism Month. And uh, at the last one, uh, she is Saumya Chain from Grumful Campus who performed at the Rotary Arts Theatre for the multiculturalism month and this is it like with the community connections and uh, if you have any questions feel free to ask thank you and, thank you. and these are um, you can reach out to the diversity team at our general diversity email if you're interested in in training today we did really just high level points of things but um, we have all sorts of different training and anti-racism training available. Michelle, you can reach him at Western, but there, if you are based, I know some folks are in St. John's. The diversity email is all across the province because we're a, a pan-provincial team. But if you are looking for community connections within St. John's, there are uh, different connections there, but Michelle can certainly help with that. Fantastic. So we've had some good uh, comments in the uh, chat. I like Murray's comment. Murray has been her own um, newcomer to five countries in three continents, and she's now back home. Um, some of the things certainly resonated with me. I remember as a child, you know, you talk about differences. Um, and, and for me in my world, I'm thinking differences can be between here and St. John's. Um, we had cousins that were arguing with us that they wanted to go to the meadow to play and we wanted to go to the field to play and 20 minutes later we found out it was the same spot. They called it a meadow, we called it a field. Um, you know, my first day working with government, my manager said to me, I asked her a question about what we were doing and she said, oh my dear, we've got your day stopped. And I thought, well, thank goodness I know what that means because that sounds painful. <laughs> but, you know, basically my day was booked solid, right? I was going to be busy. Um, so certainly some of the things I think can even, you know, I don't think we have to have traveled to other countries. We can certainly relate even just within our own province. And I know um, from working with Hillary and, and Linda with uh, Atlantic Study and Stay, like even some of the students coming into the College of the North Atlantic in Cornerbrook, if they're coming from Rocky Harbor or Plum Point, Cornerbrook's huge, you know, it is a culture shock. So I really like that phase of, of honeymoon and, and, and how we move through those things, because I can certainly see that. Um, 
as we do that. So I, I was really, uh, really enjoyed that presentation. Thank you so much. So I'm going to open it up to folks if there's any particular questions um, before we kind of, you know, wrap things up. I do want to give everyone an opportunity. I know you've answered in chat who you are, but I do want to give you each an opportunity to talk a little bit more about who you are and, and raise some awareness uh, across the group here. Um, however, anybody have any questions uh, for our presenters? I do, actually. Um, <laughs> we see a lot of people come from different countries, of course, looking to get their driver's license here. Um, so what we've been encountering lately is there's a few that um, the language, right? There's a language barrier. So we actually have authorization now to put a translator in the vehicle with them during their driving lessons. Sometimes, you know, if it's a family member with them or um, <clears throat> a friend, they can't make that scheduled appointment. I was thinking, is there somebody with the Association of New Canadians that could, you know, at certain times maybe come into the vehicle as a translator? We do have translation services in St. John's. So in St. John's, we have quite a few translators. Now, I know... Um, here in Cornerbrook, we do have some people, for example, Michelle so showed the Ukrainian family and we yes, have- Yes, they so, were from, they, we had her go in with her husband and- Yeah, that and worked so- well for us, they were lovely people. And we've had people step up in the community that speak Russian um, and have been able to help with the translation. Michelle, I, I don't know that we have an, a roster on the West Coast, a permanent one. Uh, I, I think it's been more you call people in as needed. Uh, yes, for the volunteers, it can be like in uh, two different ways. So in uh, basically for the St. John's one, how we do is if there is anyone uh, for uh, a formal forms like to fill out, like there will be a chart set up like for the translators. So either it can be a volunteering part like or like it will be a paid translation service. Okay, that's interesting. I'll pass that on to Kathy. I just thought Oh, yeah, sure. And we. That a few times later. Okay. Yes. And we also have like our uh, generic email for the Western at ancnl.ca, or you can also um, reach out to us like in the email I had mentioned on the chat. Yes, I have that. Yeah. So, is that something, Michelle, that um, maybe is a bit of a project somehow that organizations? Um, I'm just thinking a lot of these folks are out in community. Um, could they help feed to you some people we know of somebody with a particular language? Like, would you be able to house a roster perhaps in, yes. in the regions or is that something you could talk to your, each of your regional offices about? Yes. So in our office, we have our settlement coordinator, like in each our um, uh, satellite office. So this is something like once um, uh, we work in very close, like the community connections and the settlement coordinator. So if there is like anything like with the settlement related, so one of them like to get a driver's license and a translator, uh, usually it is we share the job like once when like a newcomer reach out to the regional settlement coordinator, if they need any volunteers, like we work in as a team together. Okay. So if uh, the Western NL, um, uh, the Western uh, NLI, my email address mentioned, is accessible for the regional settlement coordinator. And if there is like anything like that, you know, he would need like from my side, like the volunteers, uh, we'll work it out like with that. Okay, that's excellent. Yeah. That's good to know. Thank you, Cyril. Your hand is up. You have a question. Uh, yes, I'd uh, just like to make a, a comment or two. Uh, our organization predominantly works on issues pertaining to housing and homelessness. We work a lot in rural and remote Newfoundland, especially on the coastal Labrador and so on. We have 10 community advisory boards that work throughout Newfoundland and Labrador that are very active and connected. And I'm sure some of the uh, community boards themselves have been involved with the Association for New Canadians. I just wanted to point out one of the things that we do here is uh, professional development training. We have a, a learning center here that we can provide on site as well as virtual training. So we've done uh, quite a bit in regards to cultural sensitivity with indigenous populations and so on. Uh, we also look at doing diversity and inclusion, as been mentioned before. 
So uh, I plan on reaching out to your coordinators. I'm assuming you guys have training programs that we can present. We can provide the place and the opportunity for you guys to uh, offer your presentation. Yes, yeah. that would be me. So Cyril, by all means, uh, Roshane or Roshane, we are the team that will handle any of the training. And on our website, you'll, you can see that we have some of the slides that we took today are from our cultural hiring practices, which is a, a module. We have a train the mentor module, uh, anti-racism module. So we tailor them to fit the organization. Uh, if we're working with healthcare, then we have a lot of research that we've done on issues that arise in, in that particular sector. If it was in the spa and salon, for example, we've, we've done a lot of work in, in that. So you reach out to, to the diversity email and Roshane will get that or I will get that. And, uh, and we can certainly work with you to give some of those presentations. That'd be great. Uh, I'd just like to make a point out, I'm currently in the process. We have a social enterprise. It's a cafe on site where we hire marginalized individuals or individuals facing major opportunities for entering the workforce. The cafe was designed initially to, and I, we still run it that way, to be a supportive and non-judgmental environment. It's an individual a chance to empower themselves and of course an opportunity to make front, uh, an income uh, I just uh, completed our, our, the launching of a recruitment for two staff members. And we had in excess of 100 individuals apply for one position and the other uh, position we had in excess of 30. And over my years of working, I've seen a tremendous difference in the number of uh, immigrants that have applied. And for one of those positions, we've had in excess of 50 individuals apply from various, uh, you know, who are currently here in the province seeking employment. So it's great because some of our uh, interviews are set up and we're fortunate that we have three or four individuals that we're looking, hopefully uh, we need to get two of those to fill those positions. So it's certainly a, a, a bigger item that needs to be addressed. And of course, we do a lot of training for our frontline workers, for our housing support workers, community advisory boards, and so on. So I'll certainly reach out. Thank you. They have delicious food, too. <laughs> I was there in, in person with Cyril's group, and it was lovely. Yes. Hoping to be back in, uh, back in full operation by mid-October, fingers crossed. That'd be awesome. Um, yeah, so I guess that was another question, Debbie, I was going to put to you to, I know, pretty sure that the answer is yes, but just so the folks know that you can go into any organization, whether it's the board of a not-for-profit or a not-for-profit working staff to give any type of presentation on, on supports, right? Absolutely. And we can do it virtually or we do have staff. We've got a couple of people here in Cornwall who are trained. We have uh, two more people in St. John's and in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So we can certainly come in in person if it's in within our region or we can do anything virtually now yes okay Great. Thank you. yeah because as cyril mentioned they have 10 community advisory boards um across the province so they're they're quite diverse cyril's in st john's but supports housing outside of st john's <laughs> so that's that's what their organization's about quinn your arm must be tired your hand's been up a long time <laughs> No, my arms are fine. My arms are fine. I'm good. Good. Um, I just wanted to say, like, I've had the, the privilege of working with Michelle now on, and he, as he's mentioned, on numerous projects and going into the schools for Multiculturalism Month. And I think the, the work that the ANC is doing is absolutely amazing. And hopefully it gets to a point. I'm a person that hates labels. Like I'm a public trans person. So everybody is a label for this or a label for that. It's you're, you're black, you're white, your color, your whatever. And it just gets so annoying for some people towards the end of it. And I was like, why? And again, for what you're talking about, it really kind of hits to this point is like, I'm hoping for a day when the labels go the way of the dodo and everybody is just looked at as a complex human being and the diversity of everybody is just embraced and not shunned. Like 
it doesn't matter if you're East Indian or if you're Native American, if you're from anywhere. I mean, I think having that cultural diversity brought into Newfoundland is bettering it as a whole, as well as it brings it to anywhere. I mean, look at so many different minorities and you're hundred percent on the money when you're talking about like cultural being like either you're direct or it's kind of that more indirect because a lot of the the lingo and terminology for newfoundland is a collaboration of every place from everybody who's ever been here it's like i think as far as diversity goes and it's funny because not a lot of Newfoundlanders look at it this way, but Newfoundland is a very diverse place. It's just we've been so mixed in with everybody that, it's, you know, family trees kind of look like an alder branch. So it's uh, it's it's just so complex here. But I mean, I've seen what Michelle's doing and what, he, what they're continuing to do over there. And again, I'm looking forward to working more with them in the future. So hopefully, hopefully definitely more improvements are to come. Excellent. Thank you, Quinn. Um, I agree. I took um, I took Celtic language in university because I was just thought it was really cool. And, you know, um, loosely translated. Hello was Mary to you. And hello, the response was Mary and Joseph to you. So you can you know see the, the Catholic influence in their language. Um, but I remember my professor saying that parts of Newfoundland have such a unique dialect that it's actually almost considered its own language. And I was going to University of Ottawa, which was a bilingual university, and I had done my my French pass. So I was going around saying, I'm trilingual, <laughs> English, French, Newfoundland, Labrador. <laughs> um, so, you know, it is it is very unique. And, and I think you're right, Quinn, this this island has actually protected some of that uniqueness in some of those different communities. And I know Petty Harbor uh, was profiled years ago um, as being very, very distinct. Uh, their language, their phrasing, the way they spoke. And it's only now because of the borders, you know, travel and everything being opened up so much that they're starting to lose some of that. But it was such a unique community in that people were studying how people spoke in that community because it was unheard of anywhere else. And, you know, it's English. It's just different ways of saying English. And my husband and I always joke around about the uh, inhaling. Newfoundlanders, yeah. <laughs> how you doing today? Yeah. <laughs> Right. I mean, it's a very unique East Coast uh, thing, and that's been documented as well. So there's there's certainly some interesting pieces there. I had to laugh at the speak louder, not or the speak slower, not louder. Um, I was asked to facilitate a session in Montreal with Indigenous communities and government workers, and it was four different governments and four different Indigenous communities, and there was a simultaneous translation. So I open up my mouth, good morning, welcome, I'm Carol, and off I'm going. And they stopped me right away and said, you're being translated simultaneously into a Nuktatuk and you're speaking way too fast. <laughs> like, okay, Whew, slow down. <laughs> and I was getting excited too, right? So um, it was like kind of a, okay. So it wasn't, it had nothing to do with volume. It was just sheer speed. Um, so yeah, I could definitely relate to a lot of the comments you folks were saying. Um, any other questions specifically? If not, I'll give folks a chance to, to say hello and let uh, us know a bit more about yourselves. So Penny's done an intro, Cyril's with housing. Um, Sarah and Morgan, do you folks wanna let uh, everyone know who you are and what you're about? Yeah, I can speak. I can speak for us. Um, so we are both employment facilitators with the Youth the Future program uh, with the Canadian Council on Rehabilitation and Work. So it's a, it's a lot of words, but uh, CCRW. Um, so our program specifically is a 22 week pre-employment program for youth with disabilities. So we gear them up with pre-employment skills and then um, help them transition into the workplace. So um, I would love to connect with you folks at ANC um, to talk about like the interview process for new Canadians and how to support, if we have new Canadians come to us, how to support them um, in finding employment or, you know, uh, partnering on referrals and, and things like that. So we can make sure everybody is, is getting helped as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent, thank you. Um, but hey, 
you've had uh, lived experience traveling yourself. Um, do you want to let folks know who you are? I know you put a comment in chat, but just let folks know who you are. Hey there. Um, yeah, my name is Mariah Sampson, and I'm from Stephenville, which is about an hour away from where I live now. And it was a really, really, really um, all over the place journey. <laughs> From I left Newfoundland when I was 21 and lived in various parts of Canada, up north, uh, out on the west coast in the middle. And I've also lived in France and Qatar and the UAE, uh, Scotland and England. And uh, I have a husband who basically gets understood absolutely nowhere he is because his accent has so many different influences. He always sounds like a foreigner. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting being in so many different places and learning, you know, Asia is obviously very different from North America. And I think now it just it it's probably the biggest and best education a person can ever have is to be to travel and to spend time living and working in another place. For sure. Um... Mare is actually going to be a guest for me next week. Uh, we're doing the Entrepreneur Coffee Break, uh, which is geared to the entrepreneur community. Uh, Mare is the owner of user-friendly website design. So all of you are certainly welcome to join. Uh, she's going to be giving tips on that user experience from your client's perspective. Um, and it's kind of picking up from a conversation we had at one of our previous sessions about accessibility and consistency in language and all that. So I think it's a really nice fit um, if any of you are interested. I'll pop the registration link to that in chat or it's on my website as well. Um, but Mare and I are gonna be seeing each other frequently over the next little bit. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. Um, Hillary, do you wanna say hello? Yes, I was quickly scrolling to see if I was registered for the Entrepreneur Coffee Break, but I am, it's in my calendar for next week. <laughs> you are. <laughs> Um, I'm really excited to be here today. I'm uh, one of the retention coordinators. Retention coordinators, we're talking about speaking quickly and I go off speaking very quickly. Uh, retention coordinator at the Study and Stay NL program. Uh, we work with international students in their final years at MUN and CNA who are really committed to living and staying and establishing lives here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So that's our main goal. So everything we talked about today is just getting my mind turning. So I very much anticipate I'll be reaching out to you guys. Uh, we split our work. Uh, I cover more of our East Coast stuff and my, uh, my colleague Linda focuses more on the West Coast. So I think that'd be great to, to get you guys connected. Outside of that, I'm also working on affordable and innovative housing with Co-Housing NL and we started a nonprofit in December to help other housing projects launch forward. So a bit of a diverse range. Excellent. Uh, Quinn, you mentioned you're with CMHI. Do you just want to let the others that may not know you uh, know what that is and what some of the things you do? Sure. So uh, as I said in the chat, uh, my, my name is Quinn Jesso and I'm the Mental Health Promotions Coordinator with the Community Mental Health Initiative here in Cornerbrook and my pronouns are she, her or your majesty. I will respond to all three. Um, so we are a local nonprofit organization. Basically, our geographical area covers the Cornerbrook and Bay of Islands out as far as like do like Pasadena areas. And pretty much anything dealing with mental health, um, stigma, awareness, reduction, and since more so with my position, a uh, role into position, the 2S LGBTQIA plus community, which the acronym needs an acronym at this point. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so we do a lot. Uh, COVID kind of put the kibosh on quite a few things, but we have been trying to get back into the swing of things and having a much more of a community presence. Uh, the going joke for most people that know me is I've got the biggest mouth in Cornerbrook. So if you don't see me, you'll hear me long before I get there. And it kind of works out in my favor. So if there's ever anything that we can offer, either through uh, many presentations, uh, programming events, stuff like that. <clears throat> Even if the event isn't something that is currently existing, doesn't mean we can't sit down and make one. 
and I'm totally on board. Uh, Michelle and I, when Multiculturalism Month came out, I was like, hey, let's do a potluck. You don't get much more Newfoundlander and cultural diverse than a potluck. And it went off so amazingly well that we probably going to need the Civic Center for it this year. So it was it was really fantastic. So by all means, if you ever need anything that we can help out with, uh, reach out. I'll drop my email for work in the chat. Drop me off an email and we'll go from there. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, yes, I met Quinn through a project that we did with uh, the YMCA. Um, trying to learn about all the different organizations. And that's part of what this is about as well, is letting each of you know that there's other organizations out there that you may be crossing paths and you may be um, actually targeting the same group of people and you don't know about each other. So that's that's part of what, uh, what this is all about as well. Um, Yeri, I know you commented in chat that you're not you're not at what you thought you were at. I don't know if you and you're in a library, so I know you can't really speak um, out loud. But if you want to pop anything in chat and let us know who you are, then that's uh, more than welcome to do as well. Um, I want to thank Debbie and Roshane and Michelle for um, joining us here today. I think this has been fantastic. Uh, the recording will be put up on my social media. And uh, certainly I'll send you, Debbie, the link to it if you want to share it with your community as well. And anyone else is more than welcome to do that. A um, couple things that I wanted to mention. I'll throw a few links into chat. Um, one is a video that I've used in training. Um, and it's, it's about unconscious bias at work. And I was thinking of it when uh, Roshane was talking. And I'm sure some of you have come across this before. Um, However, it's a really interesting video about how we do want a pattern. And you were talking about that affinity mapping. And we, we want to, it's very natural for us to pattern and put everything into, and much to your point, Quinn, about labels. Um, we kind of want to segment in our head and make sure that we fit in these patterns. Um, but it's a really powerful video uh, about um, how we can unconsciously be doing that. And Roshane, you shared a story of, who you gravitate to in a room, you know, why that makes sense to you, uh, because we want to see ourselves reflected uh, in, in those spaces. So that uh, that under, uh, is understanding. Look at that, we've gone international, Yuri's down in Florida. <laughs> well, thank you so much for hanging in with us. Um, the other things I'll throw up for you is um, the link to the coffee break for next week. Um, so I'll get that up here just in a moment. And that is for the, um, we're having Marie come out and talk about user-friendly and, and tips to make sure your online presence is actually jiving and making it easier for your clients and customers to find you and, and uh, connect with you. Um, our next presentation our, is Community Connection is uh, in November. So I'm gonna go this one probably every couple of months or two to three months, depending on what the community wants. Uh, as I mentioned off the top, this is your community. Uh, I really want to be able to provide this safe space for you as a community to grow. So please feel free to reach out at any time with suggestions or share with others in the not-for-profit community um, that we're connected. So I've been um, fortunate enough to be a benefit of the community capacity building program with the government of Newfoundland and Labrador, not directly. Uh, my clients, as I mentioned, are about 80% in the not-for-profit sector, and the Community Capacity Building Funding Program is for the not-for-profit sector to hire people like me and others to do events. Um, so I ironically worked for the province and was, was let go due to no money, yet the government funds me through their program through my clients. <laughs> so it's kind of come full circle. Uh, so while Jeff was arranging for another connection with a client, uh, I asked him if he would be willing to be our next speaker. Um, so he's going to come on in November. So feel free to register for that one if you're available. It's November 24th, going to be the same timing, uh, 1130 to 1. He's going to come on and talk about the program. So what are the eligibility requirements? What do you need to do? It's an application process. What do they cover? What are the eligible expenses? Uh, that's Sort of thing and it is a program that's geared for not profit and social enterprises so um, not quite businesses but if it's a social enterprise then there's a bit of a, a loophole there uh, that can come through that so um, that is our
session that's going to happen in uh, November. And Quinn has graciously offered to maybe be a speaker for me, so I might be drawing on her for the, another one. Uh, and Quinn, you've got your hand up. Uh, I just wanted to, to pop this in there. We'll call it shame to plug, but we do something similar with CMHI, but it's more for just the local community. We call it our lunch bunch, which is the third Friday of every month. And since uh, the ANC were amazing presenters today, they are also going to be presenting at our lunch bunch session in October. So I did put our link tree in there, which is kind of the one stop shopping for all of CMHI social media informations. So if anybody would like to attend those sessions or perhaps even present at one of those sessions moving forward, by all means, reach out and we can do that. They're only little one hour sessions, bring your own food, have a, ch have a chat, learn something new. And again, community is so important. We need to come together as individuals to raise the community up so that people know we're here and what we're trying to do. Yeah. Absolutely. Excellent. That's what this is about. No shameful at all. Uh, plug away. That's that's part of what the benefit of all of this is. Um, one question that occurred to me, and, and I'm not sure if this is for Michelle or, or Debbie or Rashane, um, how do we reach newcomers? Like, I think that's part of, you know, we're... I don't know. Do they use traditional social media that some of us are using? Are there other little tips of, of where do we find? And, and the reason I say this is I met Roshane on Grenfell campus and my daughter attended Grenfell, got her first degree there. And it's a very strong international community, yet they tend to kind of stay together. And, and only because I've been in a certain role that I can kind of break into a particular group and say, hey, I'm here because of this event and I need to talk to you and, and I get to know them. Um, so any tips on that? Um, can you hear, Carol? Yep. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So what we're doing now is, since I had like mentioned before, like we're trying to make our Facebook to a <clears throat> newspaper for the newcomers. So if there is any of the organization who would like any of the information session or like workshops that is beneficial for the newcomers, uh, you can send it out to us, like our settlement coordinator, Damon Clark, he will be uh, posting it on our Facebook. So that's how like we, um, that is one of the way how we reach out to all our clients to take part in an um, event organized by an, a third party organization. So we had um, <clears throat> events posted by like several um, uh, fairs, like that can be, you know, like job fair or anything like that are beneficial for the uh, newcomers. So that's how like mm -hmm. we uh, let them know about it. And we also have a source of uh, sending um, out and broadcasted email to all our clients about if there is any event or workshops that you would like to organize, you, you just have to send the details to us and we'll reshare it on our Facebook. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So we can use you sort of as a conduit to connect the two sides. Because I know when I was with Hillary in June, it was really interesting. And my daughter works at Memorial and we were doing our sessions at Memorial. So I'm interviewing international students who are saying, you know, I don't know where to bring my children to do something. My daughter is the executive coordinator of the Let's Talk Science program. She's desperate for people to attend her events and volunteer at her events. And my head's just like, why is this not working? So, of course, I connected her with Hillary, but I'm just thinking this is in the same space. <laughs> she, she's promoting. Now, something's working because they just put an event up for October and it sold out in two hours. So, <laughs> um, so um, they're, they're, the word's getting out. But, you know, I just, I kind of see that sometimes as I'm, connecting through and as Sarah mentioned they have a program where they do intake so you know they're recruiting mm -hmm. and anyway so we can kind of yes. use your newsletter potentially yeah. as a yes yeah, sure so once when we create a partnership with uh, the other organization what we do is if you're having a Facebook account uh, we'll reshare your post or else you can send it uh, send the poster along with the details for like of whichever event it is so like then we'll repo uh, we'll post it on our facebook profile itself and tag you like on the facebook so you also get like you know uh once when they follow you and social media is like one of the great ways like to reach out to everyone now so like once when they uh follow or like, like your page they get like notification about like all the upcoming events like for them they get the updates of it yeah okay excellent that's good to know and we can share that with St. John's, just so you know, Carol. So Michelle and Damon manage the um, Corner Brook or the West Coast, sorry, the uh, 
that region, mm-hmm. and all of the regions have their own Facebook. But we also have a comms team in St. John's that does a general page, and they are posting all the time. Uh, I often am sharing things. I'll, I'll have uh, groups reach out to me about job fair opportunities or skills training for newcomers, and uh, we share it there. Or if it is something that is related specifically to job skills that you have. So if there is some program or training that you have, then we also have access our our career division. And I, I work with Wendy there to make sure they are aware of everything that's happening. So if you're not sure, uh, certainly reach out to one of us and we'll be able to, to direct it to the various departments. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I really see some, um, some synergies, you know, that just making that that conduit going through um, because we're all doing our best to try and get our messages out. And that that's one of the common themes actually when I work with a lot of not-for-profits is people don't know what we do. Um, and that's, you know, if, if people don't know what we do in our own community, how is a newcomer coming into our community gonna be able to filter through all that noise about what is it they do? You know, Sarah was jokingly saying, here's, here's my great big long title of what we do, but you know, we shorten it down to an acronym and Quinn's talking about acronyms for acronyms and things, you know, I mean, that's just the way it gets to. So add in that layer of I'm past the honeymoon stage and I'm totally isolated now and I'm overwhelmed. How do we, how do we make that connection? Awesome. Quinn. Uh, there are a few other options that most people might not look into, at least I know for the Cornerbrook area. Um, so one of the community partners that we have is with Rogers and they have a website where you can, very generic, but you can fill in for their community calendar bulletin, which gets circulated online. And there's also, um, there's the Bay of Islands radio, which can be a great point of contact because that'll hit one age demographic there. Um, and they're always looking for new people to come in to do uh, like a 20 minute or 15 minute interview in the mornings. Um, I know uh, Gianni at Rogers, they have a, on um, the Rogers public t- talk station, I think it's like channel 12 or whatever it is for Cornerbrook. Off the top of my head, I can't remember, but they do pre-recorded little interview sessions. They get guests to come in from time to time. There's the digital advertising solutions within Cornerbrook and area as well. They own a couple of digital advertising boards. They can be contacted and for a small fee, they'll, if you do up a poster, high quality, they'll share it on their digital media. Like there's many ways, but I mean, the biggest issue with not only newcomers, but getting the word out is that if you're not following the page, the algorithm won't show you the page on your likes so it's got to and boosting is just a money racket so that way you kind of spend more on getting a post shown and it doesn't always work it's really boils down to word of mouth like it's the age-old method of you know best way to get something get it across newfoundland is tell your grandmother because chances are somebody will find out about it by the end of the day so that's that's basically the best advice is like get it out there, talk to people, get it word of mouth. Social media is great, but it's, it's not the easiest way to get stuff around here, at least not for Newfoundland because Newfoundland and and Cornerbrook specifically, we're, we're, we're we're strange birds here. We kind of do things a little unorthodox compared to most places, but uh, there are definitely ways to look at and like community pinup boards all over Cornerbrook and places that if you just ask, they'll let you put up a sign or a poster as long as you come back and, you know, take it down at the end of the month kind of thing. But there, right. there's options out there besides social media that will benefit. Yeah, that's true. And um, I totally agree with the word of mouth. This this province might be large in geography. Uh, it's very small in community that way. Um, I remember being on a plane with someone and uh, when we were traveling for government and he someone asked him a very pointed question he was an executive in government he said i'm not answering that he said be before i land at deer lake it'll be on the media <laughs> you know we're midair between st john's and deer lake and i thought yeah you're right and and actually he gave me probably the best piece of advice he i i ever received when i uh started working in government he said i don't know everyone in cornerbrook everyone in cornerbrook knows me <laughs> because he was an executive in government. And I thought that's, you know, that's a really good way to look at it, to think that what you say can matter. Um, So that can be used to your advantage if you're promoting information. It can also be 
used against you if you say things incorrectly. <laughs> so I thought it was a really good lesson to learn. Um, Maria shared a little tip there. Email newsletters are uh, are much better than social media. I know I'm trying to build my audiences, so it's working for me. I, I do enjoy doing that as well. So people who somehow have given you a little bit of an interest, so they've signed up. So uh, excellent. Thank you. Um, again, I want to thank you folks for joining us on this beautiful day in September, and I look forward to seeing you all in November if you're able to join. Uh, as mentioned, the recording will be done uh, and post it out uh, later. And as you leave the session today, you are going to be prompted with an evaluation. Uh, if you could take just a moment to answer uh, a couple quick questions, a couple radio buttons and, and some comments, it helps me plan events. Thank you, thank you, Roshane, Michelle and Debbie. Big round of applause. I really appreciate your efforts here today. Um, Bienvenue, no, that's welcome. Abiento, see you soon, Namostis. Um, I hope to see you all and have a great afternoon. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.